scusiamo, ci scusiamo naturalmente per il ritardo purtroppo dovuto a una serie di questioni, circostanze, anche a una particolare eh, densità dei lavori del convegno, ma credo che chi ha avuto la pazienza ha avuto anche modo di avere una panoramica piuttosto interessante e completa di, di, di situazioni internazionali, con luci ed ombre. E poi magari parleremo di questa alleanza dei Paesi del Sud, magari a cena, negli, nel, tempo, nel tempo libero, vedremo. Lascio la parola a Pina Ridente che eh, introdurrà la sezione con Iaco Secula. Beh, ormai si può quasi dire buonasera. Eh, ancora un po' di, di pazienza. Eh, si, si ragionava prima con uh, Iaco Secula eh, di, di chiedervi ecco, se vi va bene di andare avanti col programma in maniera così come era prevista, cioè più o meno ancora un'ora, se ci sono segni poi di stanchezza, <ride> dateci eh, riscontro e stringiamo, stringiamo de definitivamente, insomma. Bene, allora io va bene, in due parole cercherò di essere veloce inizialmente per introdurre Iaco Secula che è professore eh, alla facoltà di psicoterapia e psicologia nella Università di Javascula in eh, Finlandia. Eh, Iaco Secula sta soprattutto negli ultimi anni eh, diventando veramente molto conosciuto in tutte le parti del mondo eh, per essere la persona che ha iniziato, introdotto il dialogo aperto in una regione eh, della Lapponia occidentale, ehm, trasformando di fatto tutto il sistema psichiatrico nell'ottica della deistituzionalizzazione di tutta la regione. Eh, questo 30 anni fa, quindi nel percorso di questi 30 anni eh, la situazione eh, si è molto diffusa e attualmente, soprattutto negli ultimi anni, si sta eh, diffondendo in maniera esponenziale eh, dall'Australia dall al Giappone all'America, l'Inghilterra e anche in Italia. Tre anni fa è iniziato qui un percorso eh, di formazione partito dal Dipartimento di Torino, eh, Giuseppe Salamina è uno di quelli che ha attivato questo percorso, ehm, per cui 80 operatori di 8 regioni italiane sono state formate al dialogo aperto e stanno adesso eh, continuando la sperimentazione e una ricerca abbinata a questa sperimentazione. Eh, ci sono, ecco, c'è tanto secondo me anche dal nostro punto di vista come le persone che stanno sperimentando in Italia tante domande sul perché ecco, questo dialogo aperto si sta così diffondendo e in maniera così eh, rapida. Eh, non so se oggi riusciremo nello specifico a parlare di questo ma eh, domani ci sarà un workshop eh, sempre su questa questione più specificamente eh, di come sta diffondendosi in Italia per cui appunto siete tutti invitati per poter approfondire su questa questione se non riusciamo a farlo oggi. Ehm, io mh, passerò subito la, la parola a Iacco, ma eh, solo mh, giusto tre punti mh, volevo sottolineare, due o tre punti eh, che secondo me eh, personalmente ecco, mi sembrano particolarmente stimolanti, interessanti e spingono alla riflessione e alla modifica anche di alcune eh, pratiche. Ehm, Va bene, uno sicuramente è legato al fatto che ehm, il dialogo aperto, il sistema legato al dialogo aperto perché è un sistema eh, di trattamento ehm, è stato molto ricercato, ci sono molte ricerche in merito a questo, a questo sistema, molte ricerche tra l'altro con moltissimi esiti, eh, outcomes positivi e importanti soprattutto relativamente alla, alla psicosi che vanno dall'80% di guarigione rispetto alla psicosi a una riduzione eh, estrema, drastica dal 30-33 per centomila di incidenza di schizofrenia al 2 eh, su centomila, quindi dati veramente molto, molto rilevanti, che è già ovviamente una cosa importantissima che motiva eh, verosimilmente il perché di questa, di questa diffusione. Ma anche ehm, l'elemento che io colgo come molto eh, stimolante ehm, per quanto mi riguarda e per quanto riguarda molte delle persone con cui ho parlato è l'importanza che viene data alla ricerca 
eh, da Iaco in particolare, ma da tutto il sistema, come elemento che fa parte della clinica, quindi non come elemento staccato, ma come elemento significativo che aiuta a migliorare la, la qualità del lavoro che viene effettuato. Un altro punto che velocemente vorrei sottolineare è che il dialogo aperto eh, offre in particolare alle situazioni di crisi psicotica eh, un approccio mh, più umanistico e che contrasta in qualche maniera, anzi decisamente, eh, l'approccio biomedico inteso come approccio unico e infatti tra, tra i dati rilevanti è che il, solo il 30% delle persone in crisi psicotica vengono trattate con gli psicofarmaci. Anche questo mi sembra eh, un elemento veramente molto stimolante per quello riferito proprio alla, alla mia pratica. Ehm, Un'ultima nota è relativa alla valenza deistituzionalizzante che questo approccio ha praticamente avuto nel sistema della, della Lapponia occidentale ehm, e che ha tra l'altro, si, po si potrebbero fare dei ponti anche molto ehm, sì, significativi con le, la, la valenza deistituzionalizzante dell'approccio italiano, del, eh, del, della legge 180, nei termini soprattutto del, dell'approccio personalizzato, eh, della... Eh, la domiciliarità, la tempestività dell'intervento, la flessibilità, la responsabilità, l'assunzione di rischio, cioè sono tutti elementi che ehm, mastichiamo, insomma, che riconosciamo nella loro valenza istituzionalizzante. Aggiungendo delle cose, eh, del, dei punti che, ripeto, a livello, parto da una riflessione personale per quello che suscitano in me, eh, sicuramente stimolano una, una spinta e una sfida a modificare alcune pratiche eh, quando si parla di un coinvolgimento del network della famiglia da subito, eh, allargato, portato avanti e dove la, la, mh, il eh, considerare centrale la coproduzione che si genera in quell'incontro quell e la decisione eh, che viene presa esclusivamente sempre solo nel, in presenza di, eh, di tutti i diretti interessati. Ecco questo mi sembra un altro elemento anche molto radicale che eh, veramente introdotto nelle pratiche può drasticamente cambiarne eh, l'aspetto. Iacco ti lascio la parola. Thank you, Pina, for your introduction. I really like what you, what you said. I'm be very, very astonished and very in, in a very positive mood listening all, all the presentation here today. And I'm very, very pleased of the idea that uh, Basalia and the Italian reform has introduced to psychiatry on the whole, and especially speaking a lot of the lot of the human rights of the people who have very small voice to be to be presenting. And uh, open dialogue and, and the ideas related to open dialogue has become a very much in the same type of practice, but the background is a bit different. And I thought to introduce some of the idea what happened when coming into this idea. And, uh, and you could say that the idea is to have a psychotherapeutic or family therapeutic work within a psychiatric system and how this made a change a tremendous change of the system. Uh, some months ago, two months ago, I got a letter from uh, Jordi Marfa. He's a psychiatrist, very, very uh, long experience working in nearby Barcelona. And he wrote in this, you can see what he wrote. He said that, uh, that we, had a we met in, uh, in uh, we had a big seminar in Madrid, November 2016. And in the dinner table, we had a discussion, and he had asked if, would it be possible to apply open dialogue in his clinic, and it seems that I had said yes, go ahead. And, uh, and then he writes a letter, someone a bit more than one year after, one and a half year after. He said, well, I did it. We began the first cases, November 2016. A young woman who recently suffered from their first psychotic episode And then he said, the team has been. So this is the first idea of open dialogue idea. Always work a team. And this is what they had done 
there working, uh, working in a team of a social worker, a male nurse and himself in some meetings also a psychologist. They had a 20 meeting, meetings uh, with the patient, her family and also some meetings including their friends and this is of course a second very important idea of the open dialogue, always work with the invite the family and the rest of the social network. And then he writes that the results is absolutely shocking. And uh, as far as I know, Hordi has been working in this field for more than 40 years. And it's a very strong words to use in, 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 this, in this manner. We gave up the antipsychotic in four months she found a new job in three months, she obtained a driver license and recently she began to study in a an university. And I also have a same kind of uh, same kind of responses for the people who work. For instance, some some psychiatrist here in working in Italy has same the very same has been shocked about that there really seems to be a change in the way that people are living the, their life. And my idea is not so much focused that there would be some new trick that we introduce for the clients, for the patient. It's more a question that in this idea, there is more a kind of basis values of human life that takes a much important role that they are used to take in a traditional psychiatric system. And for me, the basic idea of human life is this being in dialogue. And what does it mean to be in dialogue? It means that you are responded, you are respected, your voice is heard without any conditions and that really increases the resources. Uh, open dialogue was uh, a kind of the history and behind of that it's very much uh, related of, of the Finnish tradition of treatment of schizophrenia. In Finland, uh, it has a very remarkable work done by a professor in psychiatry, Yrjö Alanen, with his team. And they generated something that we, they called need adapted approach, where the idea was that uh, you always need, uh, need to adapt the response uh, to the unique needs of every client. It's not enough to know the diagnosis. And for that reason, you need to integrate the different therapeutic and other methods to use. And they were very fond of integrating individual psychotherapy and uh, family therapy. At the 80s, when we were starting of this business, in, in Finland there was a large project that was called National Schizophrenia Project. And there were two main work done. The first was uh, building up a new recommendation of the new, new practices in acute crisis, which then opened the way to have a community care for people in an acute psychotic crisis. And uh, they had a, a recommendation to have a, what is called psychotic teams, psychosis team, which is actually a crisis intervention team of every mental health uh, district that in Finland are 21 altogether. And the uh, other big idea was uh, working with the long-term patients and that was the initiative to dissolve the main part of the hospital bed that, that, were, that were in the, in the big asylums. And this was done in Finland in the mid-90s. In Western Lapland this happened in the end of 80s. The big step for coming into the new idea of treatment happened in 1984 when we heard about the work that they had done in, in, in Turku. Now I'm speaking of my experiences being a part of the team that work in Tornio in, in Finland. And we had some doctors, myself, some nurses who had an interest to build up a family-centered system. And uh, after reorganizing the system in the way that we started to have open meetings where the patients who was hospitalized was invited from the very beginning, where always the families were invited, and also the change happened in a way that the doctors stopped to have individual admission interviews with the patients, psychologists, myself stopped to have testing with the clients, and everything now started to happen in the team form. And step by step, we got new challenges, which led us to reorganize the system in a way that some years after we started to have the meeting with the, with the patient who has a referral to hospital before 
the decision was made to hospitalize. And what happens was that 40% of the referrals was dis were dissolved in the first meeting, and that led into a need to reorganize the system, and that was the point of time, 80, 89, when we declined the number of hospital beds from 330 to 60, and organized uh, mobile crisis intervention teams for the, for the province. And so we could say that in uh, 1990, we had a kind of a, a comprehensive community care in that area. After some, we, some years, this had been going on. Jukka Aaltonen, who was a professor in uh, family therapy in University of Jyväskylä and has been a kind of supervisor of the system, organized a, a project of uh, research in which we wanted to clarify what are the core elements of the new practice when the team goes home to the clients in a, in a crisis. And we did it by analyzing the patient records. And as a part of this uh, analysis of the patient records, we came into a conclusion that what seems to be the optimal system of care. And, uh, and we realized that while following two years' time in the patient records, how the care of uh, first-time psychotic patients had happened, that there really seemed to be optimal elements in a good treatment. First of all, the optimal idea is that the, there should be immediate help. There should be meeting introduced for the patient, for the family, immediately after the contact. Immediately means that within the first day, within 24 hours, wherever, whenever the contact is made. Then we realized that uh, the optimal care always includes the family, and in some other cases also the other part of the social network of the clients. Social network means the friends, the neighbors, perhaps someone of the working place, if you had a problem in the working place. But of course, it also includes the professional social network because we never meet with the clients who only is contact with us. All our clients are contacting other services also and how to organize the work in a way that everyone involved in the life of the client can be part of the, of the system. Then the third point was to realize that, uh, that uh, optimal care is flexible, adapting to the unique needs of the, uh, every client by taking use of all the methods of care that are available. Open dialogue as such has not compensated any method of treatment, all the methods of treatment are there all the time, but the idea is that how do we integrate these different methods into the best of our clients based on the consideration what we do in the open meetings that we have with the clients. And it, it's also mo mo mobile in a way that we go in the places where accidents happen, we go, we very much like to go to home if that's okay for the clients and so on. The fourth point was that the optimal, fourth and fifth point are very challenging of the idea, but the, but the optimal care seemed to include the idea that the professionals uh, are available for the clients by taking the responsibility after the contact. We learned an idea, we stopped the tradition that in our service system when people make contact, they usually have and respond, this belongs not to us, you need to make contact to, uh, let's say, drug abuse services or other services. And we stopped this. We started to follow the rule that whoever working in this area is contacted is res responsible for organizing the first meeting with the clients. And just after meeting in the clients, we can decide who are the best ones to take care of this system. And this is a part of the psychological continuity that from the very beginning, we work in a way that we integrate, for instance, in uh, many times the families also are involved in the social care and we invite the social worker to be part of the meeting. Or in a family there may be a problem with your child at the same time when there is a problem with the mother and we invite these different authorities into the meetings. Also in the way that uh, there can be formed a team that consists of one people coming from the community care center of mental, out, mental health outpatient services for adults. Another person can come from the social care 
and in this way we integrate the services as a part of the total responsibility. And this uh, continuity means that this team is this team is not organized for the crisis. It's not an idea that it means for five times and thereafter there are new people who take the responsibility of the care, but this team is responsible for the entire treatment. And you never know how is the treatment. For instance, in the research of first-time psychotic patients, there is a cases in which the crisis was uh, dissolved or solved in one meeting. And actually, we had two meetings. And at the same time, there were uh, 99 meetings within within first uh, two years of time. So, so you actually never can predict what is the need of specific clients. And these uh, teams who I come fr from different services should be available for the entire process of care. Of course, they can be changed of the membership of the team, but the continuation is guaranteed that uh, some other parts of the team member are still the same, even if some other, other are, are different. Then the last point of the idea of optimal care where that uh, by so doing, by meeting families immediately, by inclu including the social network, the family, by being flexible to taking use of the best methods of care that fits for, for, for these clients, and then being available, we increase safety for the family to tolerate the situation, the period of time in which there are no ready-made responses. You need to tolerate the uncertainty. And for that reason, you need to focus on the, on the dialogue. I say some words about, uh, or I don't know if you have some, some uh, comments or ideas of the, of the practical issues before I speak some words about the dialogical meetings itself. was opening the other one. Um, these principles uh, comes um, from the research, I, as I heard and yes. as I was reading. And not just first the theory and then the, the practice. Yeah. Uh, th this remind me a lot of the, um, some words of Basaglia, praticamente vero, practically mm -hmm. true. That is the same idea, okay. first practice and then uh, theory. And uh, um, I think that this is something that really is important to underline because if not since, uh, okay, there is a theory yes. that uh, I put this, just this came in my mind. That's very, thank you for the comment. It, it's very extremely important to, to, that this, uh, at the time, when we made this research 95, we also started to think, how could we name this practice? And then we came up to the idea that wh why not call it open dialogues? But it's really the case that there were not the principles that we followed, but it was opposite. There was a practice, and then we analyzed what happened in the practice, and then we can have a kind of description in which we hope can be also possible to to describe in a way that people can see and, and take something to their practice. And it's uh, all the way through that had happened that, that, uh, that uh, research is a part of development of, of dialogical practice on the whole. Yeah. I think that, uh, that uh, uh, a, a, a big disaster what happened in the early 90s in our field was that uh, for instance, within the family therapy that I was dissolved, there was a kind of damned, uh, the idea of research, that research is something that uh, make the practice to be changed, to be able to be studied. And we abandoned the field to the academic research and, and it has been very harmful for our field. And I think that one part of this open dialogue is that uh, having a research to evaluate our own practice, we also take the power in a way, uh, are more empowered for our own practice if we are responsible also for the question and also some part of the ideas how to conduct the research. And of course the second part of the research that it also informs people outside how to do it. 
Okay, I say some words about these uh, meetings itself that, uh, that are very, perhaps the core of the idea of open dialogue and also in a way because I think that uh, uh, if you are interested of applying some of the dialogical practice, you do not need to have the change in the entire system because some part of the new practice can be realized in whatever context. The idea of these uh, dialogues as a main idea in the, the meetings is that uh, we in a way think that the meetings are for the meetings themselves. The meetings are for the things that people come together and start to have a dialogue to understand more about what has happened in our life and in that understanding they become more a kind of master of their house. And this is a very big change for me, for instance. I got my training as a systemic family therapist in the early 80s. And at that time, the systemic family therapy also has changed, but uh, at that time it was very much focus on how can we have a control of the family with different interventions. And this dialogical way of uh, working is totally different from that. In a way, it's a shift from, from a, from a therapist-driven practice into a client-driven practice because the very first question that we put in front of our clients is to ask that how would you like to use the time here? Only very few words ab ab about it to make it, uh, make it possible. Wh what are the core elements? First of all, is that uh, we try to guarantee that there is a shared history on this issue on the side of the professional and on the side of the clients. These meetings are not prepared in advance, but we come into the room by same door, opening it down and start to discuss. And everything needed comes a part of the discussion through our questions, through our curiosity, and, uh, and uh, everything that we need to discuss happens in the open meeting, which means that after the meeting we do not come together and make a conclusion what should we learn about, about this idea. So it is the question, how do we learn to be transparent? In the interviews that I made with the families, they, they say that they very much like, for instance, the discussion where the professionals discuss of the different options of the treatment that, uh, that are possible in their, in their case. Uh, then the second big issue is that uh, how to, in a way, construct the meeting. This is an open dialogue, so there is no ready-made structure for the meeting, but there are four important questions to make use of the, or mobilize the own resources of the clients. And the questions are that how do we open up the meeting how do we make place for the, all the voices becoming heard? How do we make places for the professional discussion with each other? And how do we close the meeting? And for me, the very first and most important idea is that we open up the meetings with open-ended questions through which our clients can start to speak of the issues that are most relevant for them at the moment. Do never open the meeting with your agenda. That's my adv advice to the professionals. Do never open the meeting with your agenda. Always ask, how would you like to use the time? Who would be best to start? And take the things that you know that you have to handle into the end of the meeting. This is very important issue nowadays because in many countries there are different kind of risk assessment and people say that we need to do this risk assessment before we can go on into the treatment. And if you do this risk assessment in the way that you start the meeting by filling a blanket, it's very harmful to your clients. Because people may speak the most important thing in their life during the first five minutes. And if I say, wait a moment, I have to, sh have to fill the blanket, he never come back to that issue, and that is lost forever. Unfortunately, I also have research about this issue that is very, very, very dramatic way, in a very dramatic way, realized. So it's very important that we start to follow the stories of our clients. The second point is also very important, very early to invite all the participants so that they become more motivated to speak of themselves and listen to each other. The third point 
is that uh, we very much like a professional's discussion with each other. And it seems to me that many times when I analyze the meetings, professionals discuss all too little openly with each, with each other. It's very good that we share our different ideas of the treatment in a constructive way, of course, but uh, so that the people can see what kind of choices do we do when we come into a conclusion of the treatment. But of course, this professional discussion with each other is also has something to do with the, with the idea that we reflect of our feelings what comes up while sharing the, sharing the stories of the clients. I have become more and more up to the idea that this is a very embodied process because when I'm sitting in a meeting and uh, we are dealing with the very difficult stories of human life, I, I, I most part I feel in my body and only a minor part I share in a very rational story about the life. This is a bit different in, uh, for instance, in family therapy, we speak a lot of this narrative approach. But actually in the most severe crises, it's not so much a question what type of narratives you have of the stories. It's much more a question of the experiences that you do not have narrative about. It's only a kind of an experience that comes of the out that you speak something and all of a sudden you, you can't breathe, you have tears in your eyes. And that is the point when my body is speaking to me and how could we share, and of course, I myself as a clinician feel that in my body without exact words and, 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 and stories. Uh, and the fourth point is to, is, to, is to think about the conclude, how to close the meetings. And now we come into the idea following that uh, in the end, we take time for our things we, that we know that we have to, if we have to have the risk assessment, we do the risk assessment, but do it in the end of the meeting. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, then the question could be that I see that there seems to be time to close the meeting. Then I usually say something positive, feedback. I have a feeling that we have had an option to discuss of important issues. Perhaps there is need to go on even more. Before we close, I wonder if there is something more that you can act so that our clients have the control also in the end. The first words are our client's words, the last words are our client's words into the, in, in the meetings. Okay, in the very end I say some words of, of the research and I will also share you some new information of, of the research. As Pina reported, so perhaps the most known studies that we have done concerns of following what happened the first time psychotic patients and we have three inclusions period. First of them happened, uh, and two first of them happened in the, uh, in the 90s, which we first followed uh, 90 year, n n five years. It was a part of his Finnish national study also to find out what is the role of neuroleptic medication in treatment of psychosis. And our site was a site in which we did not start the medication, but the medication was only invited if the other options of treatment were not e effective enough. Because we had such a good results, we decided to follow up that with another research thereafter. And then we had altogether 80 patients and that we followed five years time. And very shortly, what we found out that a very, uh, very minimum number of people actually use uh, psychotic drugs, 35% during the five years period, and more than 80% had uh, no, no psychotic experience in, and had returned to full employment. This is very different compared to the traditional treatment as usual, and I have taken information from a study that was conducted in Stockholm about the same time in a traditional system. And you can see that uh, in the treatment of Stockholm, they were uh, hospitalized four times more than in Western Lapland. They were using medication almost in 93% almost every case. And what is most dramatic one is the lowest growth. 
in many studies they say that 60 to 70 percent of psychotic patients are living on retirement after after two years or five years and in Western Lapland it was uh, 19 percent and we have been criticized of these results actually quite actually criticism people are saying this is a fraud we have excluded the most difficult patients it's partly of the of that and partly of our own interest we repeated made a replica of the same research 10 years after, and the results were the same. So we really have verified that this is the way that happens. There were also some interesting changes taking place because, as Pina said, we realized that the incidence of schizophrenia has really dramatically declined from 33 to, to 100,000 to two. And it most probably is related with the idea that at that time, for 15 years of time, there had been a practice in which the population learned to make early contact and also other professionals so that the problems do not have time to develop as severe as schizophrenia. So of course, this is a very interesting question if we think about what happens to our society when we learn to take care of tuberculosis, polio, and so on. And now we can ask, what about if there would not be schizophrenia? Or what about schizophrenia, instead of thinking that it's an illness of brain, it's more a question, how do we organize our treatment system on, on the whole? Uh, now we are on the way to having a follow-up uh, research of, uh, of uh, 20 years, actually 19 years follow-up, in which we l use a lot of uh, resistor information and uh, this is, uh, I hope this is going to be published. I show you a table, but uh, I hope that you will not resist at this because it's not yet, not yet published. But uh, what we have been seeing, for instance, is that <coughs> we have made a comparison of all these people who came to treatment in Western Lapland during three periods, 108 altogether and took all the other rest of Finland who came into the treatment, 95, 96. And, uh, and these are the things in which we realized uh, big differences in mortality, use of hospital days, or use of contact, and uh, how many of them are on neuroleptics and how many are on disability. I will not go into the details, but you can see, you can see the idea that the blue ones are on, on this open dialogue in Western Lapland and the green ones are on the treatment as usual. And all of these respects, there, are, there is quite dramatic difference. And it's very astonishing to think about that something that happened in your crisis 20 years ago is still there even if people could have moved away and be, being living in, in many different places and, and so on. Very first, very, very last comment is to think about how come these uh, results are, are different? I, I know that they are different because I've done a lot of research. I don't have any questions about if this is working. And my hypothesis is that when we organize the system in a way that uh, we meet with the people immediate in the crisis with their very heavy emotional reactions. It's a very productive way of working because people have access to start to speak of things that they never could speak about. Then the second part, we always try to invite the family or other relevant members of his or her life. Then the third part is the idea that if we focus on dialogue and what is so important this dialogue that it aims at everyone's voices becoming respected and heard. And it's a very exceptional experience in one's life. And, 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 and through that, people have much more access of, the, of, of, of their own resources to take care of, of, of their life. And perhaps the last point, that by so doing, we can minimize, prevent the unnecessary use of medication and also that way avoid the harmful effects of, of medication. So there was some information also about, this, uh, about these outcomes. Short consideration. Um, 
now open dialogue is spreading everywhere, so in, in very different kind of context yes. and system. And uh, um, <coughs> this part about dialogism, the meeting, um, I, I have a kind of uh, um, how is possible in this spreading to uh, really underline the importance of all the principles. Mm, it means mm. that is a system and is not just a, a therapeutic approach. Yes. Uh, because it seems to me that mm, this could be a risk, that somewhere where the idea of uh, a system of treatments uh, mm, is confused with just a, a therapeutic approach a setting yes, uh, yes. The, the last piece that you were mm, that is mm. very important but is supported yes by all the the process not just be dialogic and that's all yes yeah, i think yeah. i don't know just ask you what do you think to yeah, avoid. yeah 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 i i agree with you but of course there is also uh, opposite side because i also think that uh, you can also I start to do in a way dialogical therapy if you don't have access to anything anything else. But I, I, I share with this idea that this is not, for instance, family therapy, because this is a part of the psychiatric system, and it's very very important that we realize that when we are in the meetings, we are sitting in a meeting in which we have a responsibility for the entire systems and all the processes there. And of course, that's also the case in which they become most, let's say, effective in a way, because if we combine the idea that this is uh, mental health care at the same time having very strong therapeutic elements in the way that we discuss and, uh, and, 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 and share the concerns of the, of the people, that is the best idea. But of course, the idea is to have a training, systematic training, and actually at the moment that's my, I'm, um, you perhaps realize that I'm a very happy man now because I retired from the university this spring which has made a lot of freedom in my life that I thought that I will focus more to organizing a kind of system in which we can have a proper uh, training and support for people trying to adapt. And of course, all this is very much planned to take into account all the, all, all the, all the elements there. Would you like to introduce your yes, I would very much like if there are some Comments or ah, questions? Se ci sono commenti, domande, qualcuno che vuole prendere parte alla, alla conversazione, benvenuto. Ecco. Eh, io non sono uno psichiatra, mettiamo, diciamo questo come premessa, però eh, questa presentazione mi stimola su alcune curiosità, curiosità che sono legate da un lato a quale formazione e competenza deve avere quello che fa il dialogo, immagino che non basta più solo una competenza di tipo chiamiamo clinico psichiatrico, deve iniziare ad avere una competenza comunicativa una capacità di empatia. Ecco, mi interesserebbe capire come poi si forma questa parte. La seconda domanda è legata alla medicina narrativa. È una eh, pratica recente che si avvicina a un'idea semplice. Le persone se comunicano quello che loro vivono o che hanno dentro di sé riescono a avere uno spazio di possibilità in cui la voce che ascolta, la voce che viene ascoltata diventa una sorta di terapia solo perché viene ascoltata, perché ha uno spazio suo. E il terzo punto invece è una logica finlandese. So che in Finlandia c'è una incidenza di trattamenti psichiatrici molto elevata. Ho degli amici finlandesi che mi spiegano che lì c'è una distribuzione geografica delle persone tale per cui le persone vivono spesso isolate, immagino che 
nella sud Lapponia questo sia ancora un elemento. Quindi eh, la domanda è quanto questo tipo di approccio è poi influenzato da condizioni socio-economiche e culturali del paese dove viene praticato o quanto si può emancipare diciamo, da una situazione invece legata a quella cultura, a quell'esperienza, a quella vita nel paese. Uh, thank you for the question. Starting from the very last uh, part of the question, there is a bit of misunderstanding of the situation of the southwestern part of Lapland, be because actually it's a very heavy uh, labor, uh, labor culture, because there are many factories in that area, and uh, it's a very small province, but uh, 85% to 90% of the population are living in, in, in the small cities, not rural, rural areas, but of course there are also some people living in the wild marks and with the reindeer farming and so on, but, but it's a very few of them. So, so that actually this is a kind of labor community that is most, most concerned. And we already have very interesting experiences in different cultures. And what has been surprising to me, I, I have expected more cultural differences of uh, how to work in a dialogical way, but, but, but uh, there are very few of them. Of course, there are cultural differences. How do we organize the system and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and so on and so on? How do we finance the system and, uh, and those? But being in the meetings with the people seems to be very same kind of experiences. Of course, there is one point of for us Finns because in dialogues it's very good to, to be silent and we are very good to be silent, fin Finnish people, so that, that's perhaps something that makes an advantage for, for, for us. In the training that you ask is that, uh, that it's very much a training of my own quality, so the training focus a lot of the issues that how I am in relation into the difficult situation. There is a lot of work, for instance, uh, being more familiar of my own family issues, of my own issues, how do I relate with people and, uh, and so on. And of course, the basic part of uh, psychiatric, psychiatric care is on the whole, of course. I've already forgot the second question you had. Yeah, and what did you ask about the medicine? Uh, la, la seconda questione è legata alla medicina narrativa e alla possibilità che la persona possa esprimere quello che lei vive realmente all'interno di un contesto che lo ascolta e nello stesso tempo che all'interno di quel contesto sia accettata diciamo, il suo protagonismo, il suo essere diciamo, la persona. Noi lo facciamo per esempio col peer counseling, è un'attività che facciamo persone con disabilità, mm. con altre persone con disabilità, ma sappiamo che l'importante è che la persona si autoesprima direttamente e abbia la libertà di vivere. Quindi la domanda era proprio questa, questo spazio comunicativo in cui qualcuno lo ascolta e mm. ha la possibilità di, di dire liberamente quello che sente, che prova, è immediatamente terapeutico solo perché si è costruito questo spazio? Yes, that's what I think. And, uh, and I many times also say that this dialogical practice is so simple that we don't realize that it's so simple. And I think that uh, you put that into words in a so beautiful way that I, I easily could share. So that's the point. Take seriously what people are saying and do not try to guide them in the utterances, but follow and then When we are in a crisis, the family presence, there may be many conflictual stories. And of course, the, the, the needs for our skillful way to be in dialogue comes out. How can we be in the dialogue in which all the voices become heard at the same time, respected? I just finished a work with a family who I met one and a half year. And uh, they wanted to come to meeting with me in the university clinic because they had uh, said that they had uh, such a bad experience 
it was the son, 30 years of age, he was just hospitalized in another place, city in Finland, and he called from the hospital, said that yesterday we had a meeting, uh, and it was, they, it was such a bad experience, they want to have a new kind of discussion. They had a very bad family history, but after every meeting they remembered to say that this is so strange, even if our life is a hell, they use a very strong word, and we are in conflict with each other, we all feel to be respected and heard in the meeting. And, and for me, this is the illustration of what this is all about. And through that, they really have access to new resources in their lives. Buonasera, allora io volevo sapere se nel, nella formazione del team entrano anche membri di associazioni di utenti o di associazioni di familiari, questa era la prima domanda. E la seconda domanda è, è inutile che ce lo nascondiamo, eh, in casi di forti comportamenti eh, violenti, che ti, cioè mi viene di pensare venite chiamati in urgenza oppure è un appuntamento concordato? Ecco, questa è diciamo, un po' la... la cioè l'utente sa che voi state arrivando oppure voi andate in una situazione improvvisa? Non so se... Mm. Uh. Uh, the, yeah, 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 the first question was about, yes, nowadays in the trainings there are people with their own lived experience and also, for instance, in the British system there is this peer-supported open dialogue idea. They start to work as a part of the teams in open dialogue teams and I very much welcome of this practice so that it's a very, very much new resource on the whole for the practice. Also for us, the professionals, to learn how to deal with my colleagues who has this very sensitive experience of it. And the second question about, uh, many, uh, it can, uh, I don't know many times, but it really can happen that the call is done by some family members so that the person who is the main person do not exactly know that there are people from the crisis team coming home and of course it's a very challenging situation but the idea is to respond to any call. Whoever call it is responded and there is organized a meeting and in, th in this meeting it's uh, defined what is the need for going on in the further meetings and it can be the case that the one who is the main person is not at all willing of those kind of situation. If there is a violence, of course, it's uh, selected the way how to deal, how to, how to stop the violence, how to prevent the violence, how to work in a way that our meetings do not increase the probability of violence, and do we need to m meet separately, or can have we access to meet in a, in a common meeting, or so. so those are the questions that need to be defined every time. non so se girarmi di, di, di lì o di qua mm, tutte le volte che sento parlare Iacco eh, mi viene in mente un pezzo di, di un film di Ingmar Bergman così ci colleghiamo alla nord Europa nel posto delle fragole c'è il vecchio medico c'è il sogno del vecchio medico e questo vecchio medico dice che il primo dovere di un medico è chiedere perdono io sono un medico e questa cosa, quando sento discorsi del genere, mi si risveglia dentro. Perché, eh, al di là di, prima di tutti eh, i principi del dialogo aperto, c'è cioè questa cosa, secondo me, dirompente, che, che dice Iacco e che applicano i, i dialogisti, quando uno chiama, si rivolge a te, gli si dice invariabilmente hai chiamato nel posto giusto o sei venuto nel posto giusto. Ora, io sono responsabile di un piccolo centro di salute mentale di provincia, non è quello che facciamo. Assolutamente no. La prima idea che ci viene in mente è quella di cercare di capire se nella domanda che ci viene rivolta c'è qualche pretesto per dire a chi chiamo chi viene 
vai al CERT, vai al servizio di alcologia, vai ai servizi sociali, vai al consultorio, cioè vai da un'altra parte. E, ed è un pessimo punto di partenza, perché una persona che chiede aiuto per se stesso o per un congiunto ha già fatto un lavoro che noi non sappiamo quanto è stato faticoso, ma prob probabilmente è stato faticosissimo, e dirgli hai chiamato nel posto giusto, ci vediamo il prima possibile, l'ideale sarebbe dire domani. Veniamo a casa tua se per te va bene, è veramente un punto di partenza che eh, potrebbe cambiare un po' le cose. Un'altra cosa che potrebbe cambiare un po' le cose, come ha detto lui prima, è il coinvolgimento dei, dei non professional, dei familiari, degli utenti. Eh, nel, nella formazione triennale che io ho fatto a Londra, grazie al progetto italiano messo in piedi da Giuseppe Salamina e persone di Torino, eh, c'erano eh, eh, quelli che definiremmo pazienti e in una formazione in cui non ci sono i pazienti, io adesso mi sento che mi manca qualcosa, mi manca un punto di vista indispensabile. Nella formazione che abbiamo fatto in Italia nell'ambito del progetto italiano, eh, siamo riusciti, cioè siamo riusciti, abbiamo scelto di, di, di proporre a una familiare perché una familiare ha fatto la stessa formazione con, 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 con lo psichiatra, con la psicologa, con gli infermieri, con l'assistente sociale. Vi assicuro che andare a casa di una famiglia eh, insieme a, alla mamma di un paziente eh, cambia tanto le cose, cambia tanto le cose per me, che sono oramai anziano e faccio fatica a cambiare, ma le cambia ancora di più per la famiglia che andiamo ad incontrare, che sulle prime è un po' sbalestrata e quando ci presentiamo, cioè io, la psichiatra, io, io mamma, eh, ci, ci guarda con occhi sorpresi, ma è un grandissimo, grandissimo, grandissima opportunità in più, per cui io spero che riusciamo a implementarla, questa presenza di eh, familiari e, e persone che hanno un'esperienza diretta di sofferenza. fatto una cosa monologica, il classico esempio dello psichiatra anziano che non è riuscito a cambiare. Tiacco, eh, eh, noi abbiamo in questo convegno una grande, tra le tante, una, una grande contraddizione dei processi di cambiamento e di riforma e abbiamo concordato questo titolo del dialogo aperto come trasformazione del sistema di cura non a caso so che è un, un tuo cavallo di battaglia però vorrei che dicessi qualcosa anche su questo eh, l'hai accennato all'inizio attraverso l'open dialogue si è creata anche una trasformazione non solo di un approccio ma di un sistema di cure almeno nella West Lapland o nella zona che, tu hai, eh, che voi avete eh, coperto con questo servizio. Eh, noi siamo molto interessati, mm. almeno personalmente, io parlo da, per me, sono molto interessato alla trasformazione dei sistemi eh, complessi in, in sanità e eh, in salute mentale e non credo molto mh, alle a offerte di alternative, semplicemente alle persone, anche se è una cosa eticamente giusta no? Beh, ed è quello che sta dicendo l'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità usando anche l'open dialogue tra altri approcci, soteria <coughs> e, e uh, l'ombudsman eccetera eh, sta usando il tema delle alternative ai sistemi disumani che di solito la psichiatria ha come se la questione fosse scegliere tra l'inferno e, no? e, mm. e qualche paradiso qualche purgatorio ma diciamo, io credo invece che il problema reale, chiusi i manicomi o in una situazione di chiusura, forse da voi c'è ancora del lavoro da fare in Finlandia, sia quello di trovare un'alternativa un globale di sistema piuttosto che trovare delle piccole, no, dei buoni programmi che funzionano. Questo è sempre stato fatto in psichiatria, eh, no, dal villaggio di Giel, a, <ride> e poi, prima ancora direbbe John Jenkins, dal 1300 a oggi, insomma, delle nicchie si trovano sempre di sistema o di approccio. Il problema è come cambiare 
una intera mentalità, un intero sistema di cure. Quindi mi interessa sentire un po' il tuo punto di vista e anche da questo punto una riflessione sui limiti eh, che vedi in questo momento no? del dialogo aperto eh, nel fare questo, mm -hmm. nel fare questo eh, perché credo che la riflessione per esempio sull'alternativa trattamenti coercitivi o no di cui abbiamo parlato oggi la riprenderemo nei prossimi giorni e ci sarà anche una discussione su questo eh, il no coercion a cosa corrisponde no? eh, l'open dialogue è in qualche modo una risposta dove si ferma qual è il limite che state vedendo su cui state lavorando I could, uh, I could start with the very last comment because uh, I'd be very fascinated of the topics of the discussion today and especially the very, very strong emphasis of the human rights on the whole and, uh, and also the idea of uh, going out of the, of, of, of the, of the uh, restricting part of the services. And when I think I'm not working in Western Lapland, so I do, I'm not very accurate of the practice, but I know that uh, there are still needs to develop what, especially what happens to people when they are hospitalized. So that uh, there are, the number of hospital beds has really declined, so that uh, it's now, for the province, they have 20 beds. The number of people who are uh, involuntary treatment is lowest to Finland, and it really has been for the long time in, in, in that area. But still, when they are hospitalized, uh, there need to be more work to done, for instance, uh, avoiding the restrictions and, uh, and so on. So these are definitely things that need to be added, not only in, in addition to the idea of, uh, of this therapeutic work that, that happens there. So I said that the change really has happened, that, uh, that uh, the hospital or hospitalization really is a very minor part of the treatment of the people who are. So that has been very, very successful, but, uh, but perhaps these kind of ideas need to pay more focus on in the, in the, in the future. Then perhaps a bit more uh, a kind of change that cannot be described in statistics, and this is the way of, uh, when you go uh, to, to meet with people in, uh, in Western Lapland Health District and you start to discuss of their work, you realize the difference immediately. The language they speak of their clients is totally different of the language if I go and meet with uh, some people working in psychiatry in Uvascula in the city I was living and so on. So, so, so that this uh, language of using attributes of our clients, it don't exist there. So people, and that's even people who work, they have been working in the, uh, some nurses who have been working in the system in Western Lapland, then they go and work to some other place and they, they are shocked. They came back and said, I didn't understand what they were speaking about. And I think that in that way, there is a big change in the way that we share, we really share the ideas and stories of, of, of the clients. Sorry, uh, solo una piccola uh, contro risposta, se mi permetti. Eh, ragionavo sul fatto che nei principi, ma abbiamo discusso molte volte anche con Pina e con gli operatori eh, triestini italiani, tra l'esperienza italiana che ha promosso diciamo, la riforma e, e le esperienze diciamo, più radicate, eh, il concetto di negoziazione è stato molto usato eh, ed è, o di contrattazione. La contrattazione riguarda una specie di eh, rapporto contrattuale assolutamente sbilanciato in termini di potere che inizialmente si pone tra una persona con disturbi psichiatrici soprattutto se arriva l'attenzione di una istituzione o di un, di un servizio comunque istituzionale, pubblico, e il, il, il tipo di dialogo sbilanciato che si crea, che non è spesso un dialogo ma è un monologo, è comunque un qualche cosa. Noi abbiamo cercato di lavorare su questo da tantissimi anni, introducendo l'idea di una negoziazione che è basata anche sulla gestione della contraddizione della gestione del potere. Eh, che vuol dire? Vuol dire sostanzialmente, in parole semplici, 
che ti assumi anche eh, l'obiettivo, ma questo esce molto dal dialogo aperto e mi rendo conto che non è nel quadro logico di questo, di arrivare ad una mediazione, alla migliore mediazione possibile a favore della persona, a volte introducendo un elemento mm. di, di forza nella negoziazione da parte del servizio, sperando di evitare trattamenti obbligatori, ricovero, non parliamo ovviamente di contenzione fisica o di strumenti violenti di gestione del comportamento umano, però questo elemento di negoziazione è un elemento contraddittorio che quando c'è è importante, mm. perché di solito non c'è in molte pratiche, però che ci fa riflettere e rispetto a cui il dialogo aperto è uno scarto, è diverso, è diverso, no? questo credo sia una riflessione, da noi parte mm -hmm. dall'assunzione del compito, diciamo, Oggi si è parlato di responsabilità, della responsabilità istituzionale di arrivare ad una soluzione comunque che non sia una soluzione di chiusura nei confronti della persona, di chiusura anche fisicamente no? in un luogo, in una soluzione definita che spesso è il ricovero, l'internamento. Yeah, of course uh, one very easy and simple point to make is that uh, we even know that uh, negotiation and dialogues are a bit different things. Being in dialogue, you are in a process with someone in which the, it is the dialogue that starts to lead our, our shared way of doing. When we are in negotiation, we have our own agendas that we, but that we want to share with each other. But I, I myself think that those kind of situations, for instance, in, in, in which you give up the coer coercive uh, ideas into the treatment, you really need to have those kind of uh, skills also, how to negotiate the very riskful situation that may appear, for instance, that I have a f feeling that someone is acting in a way that uh, threatens me or threatens someone else and so on. So they may need to be a situation in which you need both skills, being skillful in negotiations, but also being in, in good in dialogue. But uh, my pre-justice is, let's say in that way, is that uh, even still within psychiatry, we perhaps are a bit too much on the field of negotiation instead of being in the field of dialogues because in dialogues people in a very surprising way also start to take more responsibility of their actions that was that was not there uh, just two and then we stop i think <laughs> ecco prima di tutto un ringraziamento per il lavoro che sta facendo che permette di rimettere al centro del trattamento dei disturbi schizofrenici e psicotici il trattamento psicologico in un tempo in cui è stato difficile nella letteratura internazionale far arrivare lavori che trattassero appunto dell'approccio psicologico e psicoterapeutico al trattamento delle psicosi. La mia domanda è questa. Eh, c'è un motivo specifico per cui il suo lavoro è strettamente connesso al trattamento della schizofrenia e delle psicosi non affettive? Eh, visto che leggendo il suo libro ho immaginato che una modalità di approccio eh, come quella che lei presenta possa adattarsi bene anche alle psicosi affettive, esempio gli episodi maniacali. Eh, c'è un motivo che è legato a un confine derivato dalla ricerca oppure c'è qualcosa che ha a che fare con un costrutto scientifico intorno alla la sua idea di psicosi? Uh, thank you for the comment because it makes possible to co correct something that is very important to realize. Open dialogue really is not an idea for psychosis or schizophrenia, but it's really the way to organize our, our way of working in any kind of crisis. But uh, as I started my presentation by when did it start? It started when there was in Finland a very heavy debate of uh, 
of uh, dissolving their hospitals and having people out of the hospital and there was national project and so on. And the focus was very much on schizophrenia. And of course we know that if people have diagnosis, you have the biggest risk to be living on a retirement entire life. So that was one part why those studies became a main part of the studies that we have done in, 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 in open dialogue. But we actually also have studies for instance, people in major depression, and then we have studies in which we do not have any diagnostic criteria, but, uh, but, uh, but they, they are here. Nowadays, I think that, uh, that uh, actually I also like that, for instance, in the books, there is so much talk about psychosis. Because I think that uh, psychosis is not only for people who work with people who have psychotic problems. Because psychosis in a way is, uh, a, is a criteria, how do we understand human life? And, and, and this has been very harmful that happens in our field during the last 20 years when everything started to be a kind of reducing mental activities and mental health problems in the, in the brain brain problems and, 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 and it's a question if we really have a more comprehensive view of, uh, of, uh, of, of what happens with people when there are psychotic problems. It's uh, very important for all of us, for of course all who work and uh, for the population on the, on the, on the whole. Thank you. I try to use English. I can speak just Korean and English too. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I really appreciate for your the lecture and the about the open dialogue. Uh, I had the the work experience in Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, and I am one of the member of the the POD. It's a peer support the open dialogue. I worked with uh, the people who are in the New York. There is uh, some kind of a POD team also, and Boston also. Uh, we try to develop the, some kind of a manualized the, the system uh, using the open dialogue. And I had uh, uh, some, the, uh, maybe not the serious situation, but I have uh, some problems. So I wanted to solve that, that issue, but I couldn't. So uh, I, tried, I am asking you that some kind of a question. Uh, the most important thing I had experienced is the uh, imbalance power. And the, the, the one of, one of uh, the, yeah, one man mentioned that kind of things. Uh, we, we consisted uh, seven the professional and one, uh, one is the psychiatrist. And, but finally we just uh, took off him and they just switched the nurse practitioner because he wants to get a power always. So is there any the strategy to get a balance between the, the member and, and yeah. And my second question is, and we spend the four session, every four session, we have at least the 20 cases or 30, 22, 22, 25 or 30 cases on open dialogue. And uh, every time we spend the four session to build a rapport with a client. Okay. Yeah, so is there any, is there the average of to develop a rapport and is there any strategy you mm -hmm. can give us? Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one is, uh, I had a few the bad experience about the open dialogue. And uh, one of the most uh, serious thing is, uh, uh, as I told you, I have a two and two and six months experience, and uh, the one of the case I had a two uh, is a uh, almost uh, thirty session, and uh, finally we stopped the the client the case because he always bring he is uh, acute the yeah he's he always say I have acute symptom acute symptom acute symptom. And he brings all kind of problems from the open dialogue session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that the right direction to, to solve the all kind of issue the clients bring? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the very small question in the end of the of the idea. Uh, first of all, 
please do not exclude the psychiatrist in your team. He has to be, or she has to be heard also. I, I, I really think seriously that, that, that the idea that everyone should be heard is also the question for among professionals. So that how can we have a dialogue in which every voice is becoming, becoming heard. So, so, so to finding ways in which all the professionals would work together. I think that in the end it's much more harmful if we separate some part of the practice into having their own, own, own word. Uh, the idea of having this report, if I follow you correctly, there are also ideas nowadays, especially in uh, psychotherapy research developed, to ask after every meeting, how was this meeting, for instance, in a very simple uh, kind of uh, scale of asking, and I like that very much, so that, that could be also a case that after some, uh, every meeting that we have with our clients, we ask them to feel very shortly how was the how, how was the meeting and have a report. And uh, the third question, I, I really would need a much more information to have any ideas what would be the best way to, to deal in, the in, in, in that kind of situation. So I'm, I'm sorry I cannot give any good advice for the situation. Grazie, Jaco. Eh, grazie a voi. Eh, vogliamo, vogliamo semplicemente dire che, visto che siamo rimasti in pochi ma siamo quelli più tosti, se volete eh, possiamo andare al posto delle fragole dove continueremo a parlare e incontrarci. C'è il buffet, ok? Some of the people...